Welcome to the speaker series for Snohomish County Transportation Coalition. I'm Brock Howell, Executive Director of SnowTrack. SnowTrack uh, today is excited to host Melissa and Chris Brentlett to discuss how to curb traffic and create equitable communities for everyone from children to older adults and people with disabilities. We thank Cas uh, Cascade Bicycle Club for serving as a co-host of today's forum and APA Puget Sound for providing continuing education credits for AICP licensed planners for attending today. As a mobility management coalition, SnowTrack advocates for connecting people and communities in Snohomish County and beyond with safe, equitable, and accessible transportation by bringing together transportation and human service providers to identify mobility gaps and opportunities. SnowTrack focuses especially on the needs of people with disabilities, older adults, youth, and low-income individuals, as well as people of color, immigrants, and refugees, veterans, rural communities, and tribal nations. With our speaker series, we hope to inspire our leaders and advocates with best practices from around the country and world. And so I cannot be more pleased to have Melissa and Chris Brentlett here with us today. We'll have a Q&A at the end, so be sure to think of your questions throughout the presentation. Now, I'm going to post a quick poll so our speakers have an idea of who's here with us and where you're from. I'll share the results in just a moment. So I'm gonna post it. We are so glad to have Melissa and Chris Brentlett uh, here today. Uh, Melissa and Chris Brentlett are Canadian authors and urban mobility advocates who strive to communicate the benefits of sustainable transport and inspire happier, healthier, and more human scale cities. Their first book, Building the Cycling City, the Dutch Blueprint for Urban Vitality, explored the urban and transport planning decisions that established the Netherlands as a bicycle paradise and how North American communities are translating these ideas to build their own cycling cities. Their, more, their most recent book, Curbing Traffic, The Human Case for Fewer Cars in Our Lives, focuses on how cities can be child-friendly, connected, trusting, feminist, hearing, uh, therapeutic, accessible, prosperous, resilient, and supporting of older adults. In 2019, Melissa and Chris, along with their children, um, and I, I'll just say children, um, I'll let you introduce you, them by their names if you wish, uh, relocated from Vancouver, Canada to Delft in the Netherlands. Melissa now works with Mobicon, a bicontinental mobility consultancy, supporting the promotion of Dutch transport knowledge, policy, and design principles in countries across Europe and North America. As communications manager for the Dutch cycling embassy, Chris uses his knowledge and passion to share practical lessons for global cities wishing to learn from the Netherlands' extraordinary success. Now I'm gonna post uh, the poll, so hopefully folks have had a chance to get there. We have about 68 of the 83 uh, folks here, so I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. So we have a uh, little light attends today from Snohomish County. I think that'll pick up as we go. Um, we have some folk, have a person from north of our county, uh, 26 from King County, 19% uh, from elsewhere in Washington State, uh, 16 folks from elsewhere in the United States, and nine from outside the US. And I, based off of attendance, that's both Europe and Canada. Uh, they work, uh, five folks work in Snohomish County, um, 23 in King County, 15 elsewhere in Washington State, uh, 16 in the rest of the U.S., and nine outside of the U.S. The types of organizations you work for, 39% um, uh, public agencies, six uh, nonprofit service organizations, four nonprofit advocacy organizations, 12 work for a for-profit corporation, uh, corporation, likely a consultancy of some sort, 
Um, and we have 11 folks who identify as being individual advocates or activists and uh, nine others. So that's who we have here today. Um, we have at least uh, 16 other people who didn't take the survey, uh, if not more. So um, I'm sure there's additional folks. With that, Melissa and Chris, it's great to have you here. Um, feel free to take it away with your presentation. Sounds good. That's for me. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm just going to minimize us because I hate watching us talk. <laughs> so um, with that, yeah, thank you, um, Brock, so much for the introduction and to Snowtrack for inviting us and Cascade Cycling uh, for uh, helping to sponsor. Uh, it's our pleasure to be able to speak on the West Coast, even though we can't be there in person. Um, to talk about our experiences, uh, um, you know, what we've been researching, how we've been uh, both advocating and now working uh, in consultancy or nonprofits to help bring a lot of these ideas around uh, transportation and how it can be more inclusive, uh, equitable, and just make us happier uh, to a broader scope of people. So thanks so much for having us. And I'll get it. There we go. <laughs> um, so to begin, yeah, we've already had the introduction, but yes, I, I work as a communications and engagement advisor for Mobicon out of their Delft office in the Netherlands, but work closely with my colleagues in both Canada and the US to bring a lot, translate a lot of these ideas that we're talking about to local communities uh, through AT plans, through uh, research projects, through all sorts of uh, opportunities to make walking and cycling in public spaces much more inclusive and equitable. And um, it's a nice way to come full circle from where we started in advocacy to be able to do this now uh, from, from here, but bringing these ideas at a, to a global stage. Yeah, and uh, as Melissa's other half, yeah, I'm lucky enough to work for the Dutch Cycling Embassy, an organization you may be familiar with. Uh, through social media, we're a, a nonprofit based in Utrecht here in the Netherlands, um, a, a public private partnership between the national government here in the Netherlands and over 100 organizations from both the public and private sector that work in the field of cycling and we work with cities around the world, including many in the United States on workshops on hosting study visits and connecting them with uh, consultants producers and uh, other partners uh, to help share this body of knowledge, this nation that's been doing this for the better part of 50 years. So yeah, with that all said, uh, why the Netherlands, you ask? Why did we pack up and move our family uh, halfway around the world? Why did we write two books on this little cramped flat country? Um, a lot of people, once you start talking about the Netherlands, will say the same things. Yeah, but it is flat yeah but the weather's temperate yeah but the culture is orientated towards cycling and we of course all of those things have a grain of truth to them but uh in a lot of ways the uh they are shaped by the infrastructure there are plenty of flat warm places uh where cycling is virtually non-existent uh in this case uh this culture of cycling has developed around 37,000 kilometers 25,000 miles of fully separated cycle paths, uh, 55,000 kilometers of traffic calmed, 30 kilometer an hour slower streets, uh, an investment of 30 plus euros per capita per year, which is now, yeah, makes it a cycling paradise in, in our humble opinion. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about first, the how this came to be, and secondly, why it's so important for the people that live here. So starting out with a little bit of the why that led to the how, um, really, you know, as Chris said, you know, a lot of people think uh, incorrectly that the Dutch, Dutch have been cycling for over a century. It's just always been this way. But it was actually in the late 60s, early 70s that a series of crises actually shifted um, essentially what was becoming a very car dominated uh, transportation uh, culture here in the Netherlands, just like elsewhere in the world post-war, they adopted the cars um, hook, line, and sinker, and really started to um, design their streets to allow for more and more cars to be on their roads. 
However, with that increase in cars on streets, they started to experience a traffic safety crisis where uh, over 3,000 people were dying per year, 450 of those being children, uh, leading to a series of protests to from the public, from public, safe, uh, public health advisors, from advocates for safer streets. Uh, and at the same time, you have the Stop to Kinder Mord movement alongside that, uh, which translates to Stop Child Murder in English, uh, where you have parents coming together with school teachers, all demanding this right for children to maintain that freedom and autonomy to be able to at least walk to school or spend time in their neighborhood without fearing uh, any danger or conflict with motor vehicles. And so though you have these protests happening, and then in 1973, you have the OPEC oil crisis that also takes place where the government instituted a car-free Sunday, um, telling residents to leave their cars at home to help save on fuel shortages. And suddenly you have open street scenes like you see on the top right and bottom left here where you've got people cycling along highways, having picnics, reclaiming the streets for places for social uh, sociability. And so uh, these coming together sort of push things forward for uh, kind of a shift in how transportation was looked at. So that creates a, a very important inflection point, of course, but uh, from there, the Dutch didn't really have a how-to guide, a, a blueprint, uh, how to build a cycling city. And so they had to do a lot of experiments. They had to do a lot of innovations. They had a number of high profile failures until they really landed upon this set of best practices and policies and approaches uh, that we're now able to share and, and also, of course, adapt to other cities around the world. So we're going to go very quickly through those, uh, the first of which, and I think this is perhaps the most important point, is when you're thinking about cycling in the city, uh, we need to stop thinking about individual cycle routes in response to specific incidents and opportunities, but think of the city as a grid of origins and destinations that need to be cohesively connected uh, with a network that allows you to cycle from anywhere to everywhere. We're lucky enough to live in Delft, the first city in the Netherlands that got this right with a network-based approach uh, that opened in 1987 that made it possible for you to cycle not just from your house to the office, but to restaurants, shops, uh, public transportation facilities, schools, uh, and everywhere in between. And as a result, the number and diversity of people cycle, cycling skyrocketed, uh, and the, the strategy shifted in cities across the Netherlands, uh, this five-pronged approach, five qualities of a, an effective cycling network being safety, comfort, cohesion, directness, and attractiveness. And so from that network, of course, one of the things that's really important, one of the things we stress is that they realized they couldn't ignore the weakest link and that's where all of these streets intersect. And so through a series of trial and error, through thinking about how do we create safer streets, um, the protected intersections or protected, fully protected roundabouts became ubiquitous throughout the country. And so it's very common to see uh, any major intersections or basically where two arterial or flow roads meet some form of protection for uh, vulnerable road users, uh, be they on some form of cycle or rolling around on foot, um, where the design of these spaces actually forces drivers to be more aware of who they might be intersecting with. You'll have um, them meeting almost perpendicularly in a lot of cases. So drivers are not speeding forward. There are elements put in place that actually um, force them through uh, traffic psychology to slow down uh, and pay attention to what's happening. And what have they found in putting in these types of uh, treatments is the reduction in conflicts, the increase in safety for all users. And in the case of roundabouts, um, actually no real time loss for people moving around in motor vehicles because of just the way uh, they can move freely if the space is open uh, when they're unsignalized uh, and uh, not have to worry about stopping for cyclists um, or pedestrians, but then everyone having a free movement in a safe and comfortable way. The third point uh, we talk about, and this is uh, also tremendously important, but perhaps less visible on the streets uh, in Dutch cities, is that every bike plan needs a car plan. Traffic circulation, traffic calming, uh, traffic management is incredibly important in terms of uh, not allowing through traffic to filter through every single part of the city, but actually restrict it to only certain distributor roads 
where it does not have that impact on the comfort and safety of those uh, residential or commercial streets. Um, but also we're nudging people towards making the right choice simply by making walking and cycling more time competitive. Uh, so virtually every city in the Netherlands has one of these traffic circulation plans uh, where the uh, traffic is filtered to the perimeter of the city, kept away from the sensitive areas. Uh, and yeah, a, getting from A to B also happens to be a fair bit quicker on foot or bicycle than it does by car. And of course, we I talked about it with the intersections, but it's really important to be designing for the speeds that you want. And Chris mentioned all of those traffic calm streets that are uh, throughout the country, and that is achieved not through signs, although there is a sign there <laughs> indicating the speed on the bottom right, but rather through design. So using treatments like speed tables, chicanes, narrowing of the streets, um, that all force people to slow down because of the way the street is designed, uh, using paver stones that cause more friction, that make it sound like you're moving faster. All of these design elements are used in order to make sure that neighborhood streets where people are being more social, where you have more children moving, where we are, we are meant to be more uh, neighborly with each other are not places for driving through, but rather for moving out of as fast as possible to make our neighborhoods much more social uh, and calm spaces for everyone. So the, the bike transit combination is also incredibly important here and perhaps came along a little bit later. It wasn't really stimulated until the late 1990s, early 2000s. But in essence, yeah, there's an understanding that the bike in and of itself cannot replace all car journeys because it lacks the range. Public transportation also can't replace car trips like for like because it can't pick you up outside your front door. But when we combine the two modes of transport, you have the bicycle to get you to the station. It can take a train hundreds of kilometers across the country and then rent a bicycle on the other end of your journey. You're providing that door to door convenience uh, across greater and greater distances without the need for a car. It's attracting more passengers into the public transportation system. It's inducing more cycling as a result of those public transport investments and creating this virtuous circle of uh, sustainable travel uh, that's done on a massive scale here. Hundreds of thousands of bike transit journeys are made every single day. Of course, part of this is also ensuring that um, e-bikes have a place in the network. And we, um, what has been seen here is the incredible adoption of e-bikes, not just for speed, but also largely for senior populations in terms of um, allowing them to travel a little bit further uh, without having to have as much strain on their bodies. And so it's very common when you're moving around here uh, on foot or bicycle to see people passing by on electric bikes um, and really, you know, seeing it as an opportunity to extend people's range uh, to get uh, between city from city to city or just being able to move around their communities a bit more comfortably without, you know, having to worry too much about sweat or or any sort of other strains that you might experience while moving around on a bike. Yes, yeah, so that was in very uh, short, uh, our first book in so far as describing the how. Um, we're really gonna get into the why now, but not necessarily the why that you would think. We often focus about transport, about uh, reducing congestion, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, improving the efficiency of a street, all these facts, figures, the quantitative measures around transportation. But we wanna take a step back and really focus on the qualitative measures, that is how um, the streets that we design uh, as urban professionals, the uh, transportation networks that we build can impact positively and negatively our physical, social, uh, and mental health, and how fewer cars in our lives can result in better well being for everybody, even if you don't necessarily use a bicycle yourself. So, as was mentioned, or I, maybe we haven't mentioned, but our story sort of started out in Vancouver, uh, in Canada, where uh, because of investment, massive investments in cycling, we decided that was how we were going to get around with our family. And the network that was being built around us was really one that inspired uh, advocates like ourselves to become part of this community to really start fighting uh, and pushing for greater change to make sure that more and more people could use a bicycle or some form of cycle to get around. Uh, and, you know, really was the beginning of us understanding how 
moving around at a human scale can really make us much more connected to our communities socially, to nature around us, obviously the physical benefits, um, and just having those um, very wonderful mental health moments. Uh, so it's really, it became sort of like the, I would say sort of like the preface to everything that we we sort of discovered as we went along. And of course, Vancouver has a great reputation, has made a lot of progress in, the, in a North American context for uh, its uh, progress on, on sustainable mobility. But it wasn't until we came to the Netherlands for the first time as a family in 2016 that we had understood and appreciated how far even Vancouver still had to go. We got back uh, to Canada after that trip with our children with a post Netherlands depression. Uh, and we suddenly saw our streets in a very different way. This is our children's route to school in the morning, uh, absolutely drowning in cars. Of course, there is a bike lane under there somewhere. Uh, but in general, despite the fact that Vancouver had built all this infrastructure, had a great sky train and bus network, um, there were still tens, if not hundreds of thousands of cars that were filtering through our neighborhood every day from uh, other parts of the city that had, uh, well, we started to appreciate the impact it had on us in terms of our health, our happiness, and our mobility. So going forward, we're going to sort of focus on four key uh, themes of well-being that we discovered in researching curbing traffic uh, that really um, are linked to a more sustainable, more um, human scale way of moving around. And that's um, themes of, of age equity, of gender equity, access equity, and social connection, and how streets, when designed for better walking and cycling, can really um, benefit all these possible possibilities for well-being. Uh, so we start the first chapter of the book as we started uh, our journey uh, as residents of the Netherlands um, with a focus on child-friendly mobility. I think um, our kids were one of the motivating factors of deciding to relocate to the Netherlands. Uh, and we had an expectation there that they would have a newfound freedom and autonomy. Uh, but even experiencing it for the first time was, uh, well, it, it was far beyond our expectations. They were within a week, they were cycling to school, cycling to friends' houses, cycling to uh, swimming pools and community centers, even taking the train to nearby cities. Um, these are all things that are lost when we design our cities around the automobile. Uh, as children grow up in the backseat of a car, uh, an entire backseat generation uh, that do not know their neighbors, they do not know their neighborhoods. Uh, and there's a lot to be said for enabling that autonomy and freedom through the calming of traffic, through the provision of uh, walking and cycling infrastructure that keeps them, uh, well, able to grow up outside the watchful eye of mom and dad and, and to navigate their own streets, their own neighborhoods, um, learn from their mistakes, take some risks, uh, and just grow up independently without having mom or dad yeah, have to be by their side until uh, they get their driver's license. And the knock-on effects of that are, in terms of that independent mobility, are seen um, not just in how we've seen how our children have really thrived in an environment where they've been given this freedom and autonomy, but even in studies uh, that are done around uh, the well-being of Dutch children and the UNICEF Innocente Report Card, which is done every other year or so, frequently ranks Dutch children as some of the um, happiest in terms of well-being, in terms of physical health and skills. And this is, not, of course, transportation is one part of a bigger social system that is benefiting these kids, but having that access to independent uh, autonomous travel that, as Chris said, you know, learning to mitigate risk and understand where their limits are, these are all things that are setting children up uh, to be um, just happier and healthier and, and more uh, aware of their own self-being in a way that's much more positive that we should really be striving for when we're thinking about how we're designing our transport networks to ensure that, you know, it's not just about um, us middle-aged people being able to travel around autonomously, but, you know, giving that back to our children and the generations to come. So this is a very short video that I shot. Uh, this is our son's regular route to school in the morning. Um, we did this for the first uh, first year and a bit. This is kind of a, a gray February day uh, with a little bit of rain in the sky, but uh, 
Uh, not an uncommon sight to see in the Netherlands, uh, this type of social cycling, side-by-side -side cycling done by uh, a couple of kids. They must be about 12 years old, uh, but it's not uncommon to see children as young as seven or eight out on the streets themselves without mom or dad by them side, using the infrastructure that's been provided for them, the cycle paths, the protected intersections, uh, because their parents feel perfectly confident that they'll get to their destination safely without worrying about the threat of motor traffic. So moving to the other end of the age spectrum, uh, one of the things that we became acutely aware of on our travels here in 2016, but then after we moved here, is how accessible the city is to the aging population in the Netherlands because of the traffic comm streets, because of the cycling infrastructure. Um, and it's really providing this opportunity for seniors here to be able to do what we're all striving for in a lot of our work is to age in place. Uh, the ability to be able to remain as just as children autonomous in how they move, because we know that as we age, we're actually outliving our uh, ability to drive. And I think it, the stats that we found from the from the AAA in the U.S. is that most people are outliving that by 10 years to be able being able to drive safely. And so, if we are designing our streets in a way that prescribes driving a car as a way to be able to access the city. We're essentially telling our seniors once that they lose that access that they're now either dependent on someone else to move around or they're stuck in their homes. But inversely, if we can design more walkability, we can design uh, streets where we can cycle as we age, uh, we are providing more opportunities for seniors to have that uh, ability to feel a part of the society that they've they've grown in and they've aged in, uh, to have those opportunities for social connection, to in, for intergenerational connection, and really feeling um, even as their peers start to pass that those those moments of those high high moments, those connections with the community, they don't feel so isolated and alone, and that you know really allows for much more. Um, positive uh, experience of of aging. So part of the yeah the 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 writing of curving traffic was talking to residents of Delft, our neighbors, our friends uh, about their life experiences because they really reflected these theories and ideas and academic papers that we were using in our research and uh, nobody really encapsulated that this idea of aging in place than our neighbor Peter. Uh, he lives across the street from uh, where we were first living in Delft. Uh, has was actually born on this particular street. He's now in his 70s, has never owned an automobile, uh, and uh, he's now retired. He's a former elementary school teacher, uh, and he gets around the city on his own uh, two feet, be it by foot or bicycle, constantly bumping into old students, constantly bumping into old students' parents, uh, having those high, high moments, uh, this uh, flood of oxytocin, the uh, the hormone that uh, makes us feel better and, and helps us heal and uh, helps us to live longer. Uh, but uh, it's quite special to see Peter now in his 70s, and we still run into him in the city uh, on his bicycle or on foot, um, living his life, getting to his daily needs, shops uh, and health clubs and, and so on, uh, without that feeling that he's dependent on others for his transportation needs, or he would have to move somewhere in the city, be it an institution or uh, somewhere else where he could uh, access that. So uh, Peter's story is a, an inspiring one, but it's really a product of the built environment that enables him to continue growing old on the street that he was born. Moving over to gender, um, one thing I've particularly experienced myself um, having cycled for, I mean, I've been cycling my entire life, but spending uh, about 10 years or so as an advocate cycling around Vancouver um, and comparing that with my experience having moved here to the Netherlands um, is how much a city can do even without thinking about it to create a much more feminist experience of the city one that I one that feels more equitable uh, for women to move around or people that identify as women and that comes not just from um, having that 
connected infrastructure, that network uh, that Chris had mentioned earlier, um, but also just not feeling alone on the cycle tracks. And because of the fact that it's e easy to get from easier often because of those traffic circulation plans to get to po from point A to point B by bike, because there's much more traffic coming, there's a lot of people out on bikes and to the point where the modal split is pretty much 50-50. Uh, for women and men and so you don't feel as a woman so alone on the street you don't feel unsafe there's there's thinking about things like lighting about where people need to get you if you need to get to the shops does the network get you there to really allow for trip chaining for provision of care trips um, which are the trips that we all that we do to do um, unpaid care work that is things like taking kids to school doing groceries running errands all of this comes together to make uh, the experience for women who are still predominantly doing those trips much easier, much more comfortable. Um, and it's something that we really need to be considering um, in terms of how we're designing our streets elsewhere is what is that experience of women? How can we make that better? How can we bring more women to the decision-making table to help make those decisions uh, much more equitable for everybody? and really create a more uh, yeah, gender inclusive space in, in the transport network. So one thing you discover when you go down this uh, gender mobility rabbit hole is that, um, well, for hundreds of years, because they've been designed by men and for men, uh, our cities and our transportation networks have uh, reflected the implicit bias of men uh, and in more recent years, at least after the Second World War, that's been uh, by prioritizing the single purpose, long distance commute from the house to the office. And it's still done even in our cycling network designs today, Vancouver in particular, the <laughs> cycle routes in, in Vancouver were always about getting from your house to the office as quickly as possible. And one thing about this fine grained approach uh, with the Dutch that the Dutch do is that it actually really enables and advantages the trip chaining, the shorter multi-purpose trips that people, and it's still disproportionately women that are making these journeys within their neighborhoods, uh, prioritizes and uh, enables those, those types of travel patterns, uh, makes them possible, uh, that really uh, is, is quite special, perhaps not inherently through uh, their design, but uh, it's a nice benefit uh, that we're able to offer through the uh, high quality and, and fine grain network design. So uh, we're always emphasizing now when we're talking to cities that uh, the network design is everything, of course, uh, in, insofar as it's an allowing more people to access their daily needs to get from A to B to C to D to E and so on and so forth for the people that are doing the care work uh, in particular that may not have been prioritized in, in previous plans that uh, only thought about getting from the house to the office. Moving on to accessibility. Um, one thing that we've discovered, uh, again, through the research that we've done and through our various experiences and the people we've met, is that accessibility actually can be quite a twofold word. And I think oftentimes in North America, when we're talking about accessibility, we are thinking a lot more about people who are disabled, who have a different need in terms of how they physically access uh, transport networks. But also within that, one of the things that we've discovered is that accessibility also means access to opportunity. You know, how can people reach uh, these opportunities that we're all striving for? And so um, that's what when we're talking about access equity. That's what we were focused on. Yeah, but first, uh, yeah, the very, uh, I think, intuitive uh, definition of the word, and and this is something you will hear whenever you start talking about cycling active travel and uh, disadvantaging cars is but what about people with physical disabilities aren't they reliant on their car uh, to get around their city and of course that is true to a point but i uh, we think and and of course the research we've done the statistics show that uh, we vastly overestimate how many people with physical disabilities even have access to a car and we also underestimate how many people would use their streets uh, in using a variety of mobility devices if we just built the infrastructure in an inclusive and an intuitive way. So one incredible thing you'll see here in the Netherlands, it's 16% of all journeys by people with disabilities are on a bicycle. 
Uh, and I, well, I, I use the word bicycle there incorrectly because it really is not just two wheels, it's three wheeled hand cycles, tricycles, electric cycles, scoop mobiles, any number of uh, recumbent devices. Uh, you will really see quite a diversity of cycles uh, on the cycle paths. Uh, but again, it's only because that space is smooth, wide, uh, and direct and, and built to be as inclusive as possible. So Chris mentioned that uh, over assumption that we make around uh, who has access to a car in the first place. And we did find through the research that uh, in the UK, for example, 60% of individuals living with a disability don't have access to a car. Um, and why that's important to remember is because we so often in the transport field are focusing on counting the trips that people do take. We count how many people are cycling to work or cycling to the shops, but we never really think about uh, counting the trips that people don't take because we are assuming uh, car ownership or car usage or dependence for people. And so rather than focusing on, yes, we need that parking space out front of the shop because someone with a disability needs to maintain access, rather we should be thinking if we don't create these mobility lanes for people that are smooth and wide and cohesive and connected, who are we disadvantaging in terms of being able to access those environments? Um, and just to add on to this, while we're talking about physical disabilities, also thinking about how people with visual impairments access the city, um, where there's this, again, this assumption is a misnomer because people with a visual impairment will not be able to drive. So therefore, we're saying you have to be dependent on someone else. And we're not taking into account how they do access the city through, uh, through walking, through a mix with public transportation and really we should be focusing more on shifting towards uh, that kind of thinking is how do we create safe transport networks to make sure that with any kind of physical disability someone maintains their access. So another story we were lucky enough to tell in curbing traffic was of our friend Maya and uh, Maya is originally from Tel Aviv. She moved to Delft uh, about 15 years ago and, and unfortunately she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis uh, around that time and she her driver's license was taken away uh, and obviously uh, all the emotions that go with that but she suddenly discovered that with a scoop mobile that was gifted to her well sorry uh, subsidized to her by the municipality uh, she was able to use the traffic comp streets and the cycling infrastructure uh, to continue her daily life and and here she is now this is a webinar that an hour-long webinar that Melissa did with Maya uh, on the Mobicon YouTube channel, following her around on her daily needs. She takes her kids to school. She drops her books off at the library. She takes classes at the university. Um, she is a, an independent and autonomous person, uh, even despite losing her driver's license, again, and down to the cycling infrastructure and the, the uh, traffic calming principles that are in place in Delft. And uh, here she is, yeah, having a lovely moment with a friend. Uh, and uh, again, Maya is just such an inspiration, such a delight. And uh, uh, she was actually, I think uh, her mom's trying to convince her to move back to Tel Aviv, uh, but she's uh, holding firm because she knows what she'd be giving up insofar as going back to a city where she'd be a second class citizen. She'd be uh, pushed on a crowded footpath. She would lose that freedom and autonomy that she enjoys uh, here in Delft, where she's uh, rolling straight into the supermarket to get her. Uh, groceries for the day. I just, I'm sorry, I, I always include that bit of the video if I can, because I think it's just this lovely moment of social connection uh, that wouldn't be possible for Maya and for her friend if that was a parking lot full of cars. Um, moving on to access to opportunity, uh, Chris talked earlier about the bike train combination um, and how that's really helped the two systems really grow and, and thrive. Um, but with that also comes this uh, ability for people to uh, not be reliant on a car in order to access education, to access work, to access healthcare. And that's because not just of the um, ample bike parking at train stations, like you see in the photo on the bottom left, but even thinking about how does the cycling network interconnect with bus networks and with trams. Um, and we, I included a North American example in this, just to say that this is happening. The bottom right is from uh, Montreal in Canada of thinking about how do we connect cycling with public transportation to allow people that opportunity to travel those further distances. As Chris said, we aren't going to make necessarily entirely by bicycle in a relatively cost-effective way 
that ensures that even for people living in lower incomes, they can still have that same right to access um, the same opportunities as those with a little more uh, income stability. So why is that so important in this conversation? And this is, uh, well, these are the latest and greatest numbers we were able to dig out is the tremendous cost of car ownership. And this is not a conversation that we're having right now is including depreciation, maintenance, parking, gasoline. In the United States, it costs on average uh, over $12,500 uh, to own and operate a motor vehicle. Uh, that's a tax on a family, and, and if you're a two- or a three-car family, it's a tremendous burden uh, financially, around a third of the median income, just being put towards your transportation uh, on top of housing, on top of food. You're not left with very much to live your daily lives. So the more we can do um, to alleviate that financial burden, of course, the more we're uh, uh, lifting families, uh, and especially those that are in lower income brackets, um, from uh, that uh, that economic burden uh, that we've placed on them simply through the design of our streets and our mobility networks. So we share this video of, of Chris, it's on high speed, he does not normally cycle this fast, um, of his former commute from our home uh, to the train station. Shortly after we moved here, uh, Chris's office moved from Delft to Utrecht. And so he has to take the train to get to work every day. And this is just, you know, not a very long bike ride, but very continuous. He hasn't put his foot down once. Uh, and this cycling network is going to take him straight to the train, straight to the bike parking, where he'll hop on the train, get to work, and on the other end, take an OV feats, which is the national bike share scheme uh, to get to the final destination. Um, all because there was a thinking, how do we connect these two networks together to make sure that uh, people like Chris or anyone else can still access their jobs without having to default to a car simply because of an office relocation. Oops, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, and, and I mean, we could spend a, a lot of time talking about these other topics. Uh, of course, they're incredibly important, but I think uh, things that we've lost by designing our streets uh, around the automobile. And that the first thing is just uh, this idea of social connection, social cohesion within our communities. Our streets are no longer places where we want to spend time. Uh, we've lost a sense of pride and ownership over our streets uh, because there's so many and, and such fast uh, moving cars zipping through uh, our streets. So the more we can slow the traffic, the more we can reduce the amount of traffic, uh, the more we're restoring that sense of pride and place uh, in our streets and hopefully creating more of those high, high moments within our cities. At the same time, those traffic comp streets also allow for moments of therapeutic release. Um, one of the things that um, I really enjoyed about my former commute in Vancouver was riding along the seawall, but as soon as I stepped away from the seawall, I was met with a lot of traffic. And so all that stress relief that I had was lost. Um, and one of the things that we have found in this move and what we find in traveling to cities where they are uh, calming or removing cars altogether in certain spaces is that people don't have to actually escape their cities just to have moments of connection to nature, to quiet, to, to calmness that really allow us um, all together to be able to de-stress. And I think it's what a lot of us really appreciated about the quietness that in a lot of our cities during the pandemic. And we should, shouldn't should forget what that felt like and how it was possible. And that was through the reduction of the predominance of cars to allow for those really high quality spaces. Um, and we should be really designing for that going forward to make sure we can all have these moments of therapy without having to have really expensive holidays to somewhere tropic. So on the topic of noise, uh, yeah, we, we spend an entire chapter of curbing traffic exploring that. I think one of the things you'll notice as soon as you step off a train in the Netherlands is how quiet their cities are. Uh, well, that the, the the soundscape is very different. You don't hear the roaring of engines, the sound of tires uh, on asphalt, the friction, uh, but you sound you hear people, you hear birds, you hear church bells, you hear this tapestry of sound that exists uh, simply because the the cars have been largely removed from the equation. And uh, it's worth having a conversation about why we've come to accept our city as noisy places, as the famous saying goes: uh, "Cities aren't loud, cars are loud." Uh, and the fact that 
well, noise pollution is actually doing a lot of untold damage to our bodies uh, in terms of our physical and mental health. And we're only starting to understand that uh, through the medical research that's coming out. Uh, and, you know, finally, when from the social aspect, when we um, spend more time being social together, when we can hear each other in our cities, when we have these moments of therapy, when we're seeing all these different demographics of people out on our streets, we're actually creating a much more trusting city. Uh, and this is done in part through design by enforcing people to interact with each other, to make eye contact, to use subtle cues so that you can predict what the people around you are going to do as they're moving through the transportation environment. Um, but you also learn to trust people outside of your proverbial bubble because you are forced to have these face-to-face -face interactions with them. Uh, and this can only be achieved when we actually create more walkable, more cyclable areas uh, and reduce the predominance of cars because we know when we're behind the wheel of a car, we're very sheltered. We're thinking only of how we're moving because the traffic environments are dictating for us how we can move. Whereas when we move at a human scale, it, it really returns that humanity back to how we experience our cities. So I think this is the best uh, example of, of that. The One of the amazing things about Dutch cities is you'll see very few stop signs and very few traffic lights. Uh, and a lot of these intersections rely on this idea of social trust. Uh, for people to get through them and navigate them, uh, eye contact, simple hand gestures and body gestures uh, to figure out who's going to yield to whom. And uh, this is not far from our house in Delft. This is uh, an intersection where there are no uh, controls or signals. Uh, and you can see everything is flowing just fine and, and people trust each other to behave in a predictable way. Our favorite moment, of course, is this group of students who bump into each other in the street and stop and have a conversation uh, because they feel like they can stop in the middle of the street and have a conversation. And there aren't many places in the world uh, where that can happen. We're just happy, lucky enough to live in one of those, of those places. And finally, all of this really comes together to create much more resilient cities. Uh, when we are designing spaces that um, are calmer, where we can build the nature back into those spaces uh, where we can move at a slower space, we're actually creating a very resilient city, not just to the environment st environmental stresses. We know with more trees and more shade, it does cool our cities but also in terms of the strains that can happen on transport networks. And that was one of the things that we experienced living here during COVID uh, was that where other cities were scrambling to put in pop-up bike lanes or to build out more public spaces for people to get outside at a uh, socially distanced way, uh, we didn't see a lot of that here because that had already been designed into the way people could cycle around their city comfortably with a lot of space, where we had these walkable environments, these public squares, uh, where the public transport network could really complement all of that without having to deal with a great amount of strain, uh, even though uh, even through limited capacity. And so going forward into the future, knowing that we're going to extreme, experience more extreme weather events, knowing that there will be future probably oil crises, uh, we are kind of currently in one, there could be future pandemics. Designing transport networks is one way that we can make sure that our cities are more resilient to whatever changes and stressors are coming in the future uh, to ensure that everyone can still maintain a quality of life um, without having to really sacrifice in order uh, to make to yeah live with whatever is coming next. So we like to end our presentations with a existential question, maybe a rhetorical question. Um, I wish this was satire. Unfortunately, this is a very real proposal from the Peloton Corporation who see a future where we will all get a little bit of exercise on our way to the office in the morning. And of course, uh, for all the reasons we've listed, not the least of which is the tremendous amount of space and resources required to move everybody in a big glass uh, and metal box, we would argue that we need to be building more human scale, uh, social and resilient streets. Those are our two on the right-hand side, first experiencing Amsterdam uh, in 2016. And we wish uh, every person uh, that same level of connection and happiness. 
so with that, we've come to the end of the presentation. If you would like to learn more about the how uh, the Dutch have achieved that and where those are these principles are being applied in North America, uh, pick up building the cycling city. Uh, or uh, if you want to learn and or if you want to learn more about why uh, curbing traffic, the human case for fewer cars in our lives touches more on those uh, mental, physical and social benefits of cities that are designed for people over cars. And both of them are available through Island Press, who's our publisher, um, or you can buy them from local bookshops or wherever you choose to buy books. Um, but with that, we will uh, yeah come back for questions and um, we hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris and Melissa. That was a great presentation. Um, we have uh, several questions in the chat um, and I'm gonna kind of bounce back and forth through them. A couple of you, I may ask you if you'd like to come on camera or on audio to ask it yourself, um, but I will just lead off with uh, Nathan's question which is um, just what are the mode shares in the Netherlands um, and by comparison in Vancouver, you know, I think in the most urbanized area, you have a pretty high mode share, but out a little farther away from downtown Vancouver, you have a lower mode share. I think city of Seattle has been stuck at about 4% bike mode share for quite some time. So yeah, I like there. Yeah, I think uh, Va Vancouver benefits from being a fairly small municipality in a very large region. So if you take the city of Vancouver itself, which is 600,000 people in the densest part, the sustainable mode split is around 60%, uh, with cycling being around 10%. Uh, but as you get further and further out the city, and if you're talking about region-wide, which is two and a half million people, I think the car mode share is closer to 80%, uh, which is quite damning of, of, of course, the the lack of options outside of the, the urban core. Um, the modal splits in the Netherlands really, yeah, they they differ from city to city. Here in Delft, uh, the sustainable mode split is around 80%. Uh, so that's 50% bicycle, 30% uh, walking, 10%. No, no, it's math doesn't work. 25, <laughs> sorry, 50, 50, 25, walking, five, public transport, and then the car mode split is around 20%. I mean, that's pretty consistent across most Dutch cities, Utrecht, Amsterdam, uh, the only exceptions being Eindhoven and Rotterdam, which are a bit more car orientated for historical reasons. Uh, they were damaged during the war and rebuilt around the car, but even they enjoy uh, 25, 30% bicycle mode share uh, and a solid 50 to 60 percent mobile split so the difference is is quite noticeable uh it's not to say that the Netherlands is perfect but uh and car use is still growing here and the rate of car ownership is still shockingly high compared to the rest of Europe um but they've they've really yeah done a great job in terms of it's a it's that people have choice and i think yeah. what's what's important to remember we we often talk about modal split as like these holes these very homogenous cycling walking public transportation um and i wouldn't say that necessarily all counts take into account things like um multimodal trips but i think what's particularly interesting is the gender modal split particularly for teenagers and for seniors where it's a reverse modal split where you have more teenage girls and more senior women cycling uh, than their male counterparts. And in I know in North America, a lot of what we're striving for is to get more women uh, and more children and more seniors on bikes. And so those are important things to remember is that a lot of this design, although not explicitly, as we said, designed for women, um, is actually resulting in this modal reverse modal split. Um, I'm going to kind of combine the next two questions and um tip off to, to die. Uh, if you'd like to uh, ask it out loud, uh, feel free to. Uh, I'll cue for that. So Cecil um, highlighted that European cities are much more compact than most US cities or North American cities. Um, and because of that, it makes it a little bit more difficult for walking, biking, uh, other trips. Um, Dai asks, you know, so, you know, based off of the experience 
in Europe, how, what, what are your recommendations for the US uh, for how do we shift our built environment uh, so that we can support walking and biking? Um, yeah, and Di, if you feel for, if you want to come off mute, feel free to add anything you like to that. Uh, I will um, go in and see if I can allow you to talk. So, <laughs> I mean, it's there. It's a great question. It's one that we get a lot. Um, hi, Di. <laughs> how are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I um, think. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, we, we do get this question around um, the, the space that North American cities occupy. Um, we we're actually just talking to somebody yesterday about uh, Australian cities with the same context. And our advice generally is to, we're, we're, like we were talking about, we're so often focused on the long distance trips, the, the commutes to work, when a lot of times what we can do is start with the lower hanging fruit, which is our sh our shorter trips, which are much more frequent, not only in terms of um, uh, the time it takes to do them, but also the number of trips that we take in a day. Uh, and so one of the things that Chris has been working on with the city of Austin through the DCE, and we are working on with a number of cities uh, in North America is how do you capture uh, the, the shorter distance trips and really allow for those and then allow the network to build out from there. Um, understanding that, yes, yeah, someone's not going to cycle for uh, 10, 15, 20 miles to get to, to work every day, but they might cycle for two to five miles just to get to a grocery store, or to get to the community centers. And so trying to design more for those, more for the local trips, understanding that we might be able to capture all, capture all but let's let's start small and build out from there. Okay, okay. So uh, I mentioned the, the concept of uh, urban villages that are happening in some US cities, including Seattle. So I would imagine mm -hmm. that maybe a good starting point to build urban villages with access to stores and other amenities within the within walking or back in distance, then make sure we have good infrastructure to make possible for people to walk or bike in that close proximity, then start from build up from there. Is that a feasible approach? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and yeah. also give those villages access to fast, frequent public transportation. <laughs> uh, Most definitely, I think yes, thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for answering my question. Appreciate it. I'm going to try to sneak in a few more questions here. Um, Sherman asks about uh, how the increased use of electric bikes impacts the system. Uh, I think, especially with regard to safety, given their higher speed. And there was a question about whether small motorcycles were still allowed within the bikeways as well. Yeah, e-bikes and uh, mopeds are still, well, probably the biggest challenge right now that Dutch cities are facing. Um, what is interesting is that they're largely not used to necessarily travel faster. Uh, the average e-bike user here is only moving about two or three kilometers per hour quicker than, on average, than a regular bike user, but more of a range extender. So it's allowing people further and further out the city to access uh, the city itself. But having said that, yeah, it's creating congestion on the cycle paths. It's creating these slight differences in mass and speed, especially with the rise of electric cargo bikes. That's just putting pressure on the existing infrastructure and forcing authorities to think even bigger, uh, especially around width. So uh, last year, the national government updated its guidance around width. Um, it is now uh, required a, a minimum width of two point six, 2.3 meters, sorry, which is uh, what, about eight feet for a one directional cycle path. So 16 feet for bi-directional. Uh, and this allows for this side-by-side -side cycling along with comfortable passing and allows, yeah, still an eight-year-old to ride on the same cycle path um, as a e-bike. The mopeds themselves prevent their own unique challenge. They've uh, been allowed here since the 1980s. Um, they do serve a, a mobility purpose for a certain segment of the population. So we're always hesitant to say, yeah, ban them uh, because people do rely on them, including our elderly next door neighbors. 
Um, but uh, there are municipalities are taking steps in terms of restricting their use of the cycling infrastructure. Um, they've just brought in a helmet requirement for mopeds uh, January 1st. Um, and yeah, just uh, trying to reduce that friction and that difference in speed and mass on the cycle path where possible. The larger push, I think, will end up being for a blanket 30, kilo 30 kilometer an hour speed limit within all Dutch cities so that those people who want to travel a little bit faster above 20 kilometers an hour can use the roadway uh, and then the cycling infrastructure is reserved for those quote unquote slower cyclists. I appreciate that. So about 15 miles per hour uh, for those in the US, that'd be the generally the speed. Um, I also appreciate the social aspect of the bikeways, of having a wide enough width uh, of the bike lanes. One of my uh, beefs in Seattle and the region here is our bike lanes are almost five feet or 10 feet for a bi-directional at most. And so you can never ride with your partner uh, or your you know, family side by side like you would in a car. Um, yeah. It was very antisocial in that regards. Uh, last question I'm giving over to Ross, um, which is how are transportation projects funded differently in the Netherlands versus US, if at all? You know this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, I think what's really interesting, um, you know, transportation for the most part is a municipal responsibility. With the exception of the uh, the trains, uh, which are national public transports, more regional. Um, but um, yeah, I mean the, the Dutch are taxed <laughs> quite highly, uh, as you can imagine. I think we're paying some of the highest tax rates in the world. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, it comes down to I think um, viewing transportation as an investment rather than an expense. And one thing, really interesting thing that uh, is done here in the Netherlands is that every single infrastructure investment requires a cost benefit analysis. What are the larger costs to society and uh, cost benefits to society in terms of public health, congestion, reduced maintenance, um, noise and air pollution? And these numbers are quantified. And, and as a result, you know, you can imagine active travel, public transport uh, is prioritized and car travel becomes less desirable in terms of uh, an expense but at the end of the day when you're not spending uh like a drunken sailor on expanding your road network and maintaining that road network there's a lot of money that can be put towards uh other modes of transport so that was a long way to not answer that question <laughs> <laughs> because uh it's really not our area of expertise but uh if you do reach out uh via uh, our website, we can put you in touch with somebody who can probably answer that question more explicitly. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Chris and Melissa, for a wonderful presentation. We're a little bit over. I'm going to wrap this up here. Um, so coming up next are several events for SnowTrack. Um, you can register or learn more about them at gosnowtrack.org. Uh, May is Bike Month, and this Friday, two days from now, is Bike Everywhere Day. You can ride to a celebration station to get swag, tune-ups, and all-around great vibes at one of four Snohomish County cities. One of them is not actually in Snohomish County. Alderwood, Bothell, Edmonds, and Everett. Um, snow Track will actually be at the Everett Station at 6 a.m. to celebrate any people who bike to the early morning Sounder trains. Then later on Friday at 12:30, Snow Track has our bi-monthly partner meeting. Partner meetings are an opportunity to hear presentations and exchange updates about transportation issues in Snohomish County. Attendees include public, private, and nonprofit transportation human service providers and planners, and all community stakeholders are encouraged to attend and participate. Finally, in June, which is Ride Transit Month, we are partnering with Transportation Choices Coalition to host two speakers. On June 21st, we are hosting Nathan Voss, a King County Metro bus driver and author of The Lines That Make Us, Stories from Nathan's Bus. His empathetic approach to bus driving and life will be an inspiration to us all, and I am hoping a few bus drivers are able to join us to hear his words of wisdom. 
Um, we are in the process of rescheduling our speaker forum with Jarrett Walker, author of Human Transit, How Clear, Clearer Thinking About Public Transit Can Enrich Our Communities and Our Lives. Uh, so stay tuned for the change of date. Thank you all for joining us today. We hope to see you again soon. Until then, ride happy.